Well, good morning, church. I hope you're at least as glad as I am to be here, uh, not hunkered down somewhere on the East Coast or digging out from the storm. Um, <clears throat> do be mindful, though, that there are people in need, and there's an announcement, I think, in our, our the prayer sheet in our bulletin, just to remind that pray for the people in the Bahamas and on the East Coast, and if God moves you to you know, support the the help there with a, a gift to Samaritan's Purse or the Red Cross, that would certainly be a, a wonderful and godly thing to do. Well, we've been looking at a lot of the facets of this diamond that we're calling worship in this series on rebuilding the foundation of worship. We talked about putting God first in life before everything and everyone else. That God has to have the topmost place and priority in my life. We talked about worship, declaring God's worthiness saying out loud uh, his ultimate value above everything else, that it's a response to the mercy of God. We worship because of what God has done for us and shown us, particularly in the mercy shown on the cross. And we recognize that all worship is built on sacrifice, particularly the sacrifice of, of Christ. That it's a way of loving God with every aspect of my being, spirit, soul, mind, and body as well. That when I worship, I'm realigning myself with the kingdom of God. It's a way to correct some of the things that the weak does to us. Talk about the importance of singing. <clears throat> it's a great activity, even if you're not very good at it. And I spent some time talking about these postures, the, the postures that we must assume in our heart, and certainly, occasionally, even the physical postures can help us do that. And finally, the importance of responding with physical expressions and active participation in worship. That is, I'm not just here as a, as a spectator. There's a lot more in the scriptures that we could consider regarding worship, but I want to finish this series by looking at an example from the New Testament of a church that was facing some very real problems, including problems that were related to their corporate worship. And that church was the church in Corinth. Our passage this morning was from Paul's letter to them, which we refer to as 1 Corinthians. And there's an awful lot that we can learn from reading and studying 1 Corinthians. It's, it's a rich and very full book. Paul, Paul's letter to them is, is filled with theological depth and practical insights. It's very rewarding, particularly because it has a lot to say to us about church life and our corporate experience together, including our corporate worship experience. In chapter 13 of this letter, which was read just before this, it's one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. It's known as the love chapter. And it's considered, actually, by, by scholars, many scholars, to be one of the greatest examples of literature in all of human history. Uh, not just biblical scholars, but just in terms of literature. It's one of the best examples. And it's, of course, regularly used in weddings, it's a profound reminder of what it's going to take for this marriage to flourish, what kind of love is needed. You know, even non-Christians will borrow this scripture and refer to it as a way to uh, find, I don't know, inspiration or encouragement for their own thoughts about love and relationships. And Paul's really exquisite poetry particularly the heart of it there in verses 4 to 7, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. It's wonderful for reflecting on the qualities of genuine love. It's, it's great to meditate on those verses and to think about that. And it's easy to apply those to marriage, and it's certainly important to apply them to friendships, to parenting, and even to personal growth, because it, 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 it answers the question, well, what kind of person ought I be, to be? What am I trying to grow up into. But you really can't get better advice on relationships than 1 Corinthians 13. But Paul wasn't thinking about giving advice for couples who are preparing to get married when he wrote that chapter. He wasn't writing about what makes for good relationships and friendships. And he certainly wasn't trying to write some catchy poem for the front of an anniversary card. In its historical context, in its literary context, chapter 13 has a very different purpose, a different aim. Paul had something very specific in mind when he wrote these verses. 
He was focused in his thinking on the Corinthian church and their problems in worship. Let me explain a little bit of the background to help you see what's going on when Paul wrote this letter to this church about love. Paul had come to Corinth in the year 50 or 51 A.D. He stayed there about 18 months to two years. He was preaching the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles, planted a church that consisted mostly of God-fearing Gentiles, these Gentiles who had begun to identify with the synagogue, come to believe in the God of Israel. There were a few Jewish believers in the congregation, and there were a few that were just raw pagans. They'd come from, from pure pagan idolatry. <clears throat> and you can read about his time in Corinth in Acts chapter 18. After he left Corinth, Paul goes back to Jerusalem and to Antioch to report to, uh, to the churches there about his ministry. And then he comes back towards Corinth, gets to Ephesus in Asia Minor, what we would call Western Turkey today. And he stays there about three years. And it's during his time in Ephesus, toward the end of that time, that he writes this letter to the church in Corinth about the year 55. And we call this letter 1 Corinthians. But it actually wasn't the first letter he had ever written to them. If you read 1 Corinthians, you'll get to chapter 5, and around verses 9 to 11, you'll see that Paul refers to an earlier letter that they had apparently misunderstood quite badly, and he has to correct some of those things. And since that earlier letter, there's been a number of communications back and forth between Paul and the Corinthian church. He it seems that in his absence, there's been a number of problems that have developed, and Paul's been doing his best to try to solve those problems while he's still apart from them in Ephesus. He's written to them. He sent Timothy, his protege, his assistant, his beloved son in the faith, to try and work things out with them, and nothing has worked. Those problems started fairly early on after Paul left. The church began to divide into factions, into different groups, and each group had their favorite pastor, their favorite preacher. They, they identified with him. And some began to question Paul's authority as an apostle and to dismiss what he had said because his preaching style wasn't eloquent enough. It was too rough, too rudimentary. But there were serious moral problems in the church. There were relational problems, there were doctrinal problems, there were issues between Jews and Gentiles, the issues between the rich and the poor. The church was a mess. But in particular, there were very substantial problems that related to their worship. There were some who had started participate, or I should say who continued to participate in idolatrous ceremonies in the pagan temples, even after they'd come to Christ. And they were treating it as if it didn't really matter because, well, they didn't think they were real, so what difference does it make if they went in and went to a sacrifice there just to get some meat? Their worship times had become chaotic, had become uh, disruptive and disorderly and, and semi-mystical. And women in the, in the church who were unfamiliar because women at that time weren't, weren't educated, so that they weren't familiar with the normal expectations and the behaviors of how you, go, how you learn in a formal learning setting. And so they were taught, well, we're free in Christ in this newfound freedom. They were abusing that and, and disrupting the teaching time with their questions. And Paul has to correct some things there. And there were some in the church who were misusing the gifts of the Spirit who were uh, thinking that somehow these gifts were a reward because they were so great or a symbol of their spiritual maturity, which is not the case, and Paul's having to correct that. Their communion times were an absolute disaster. It, their communion times perpetuated the, the divisions between rich and poor that characterized the culture and were not supposed to characterize the church. Underneath all of the division and the disorder and the deviance was a very clear misunderstanding of the gospel. They, they had it exactly wrong <laughs> and misunderstanding God. And so Paul has been trying to deal with this, and now there's a group that has come to report to him about what's going on in the church, and they've brought along a list of questions that they have. 
questions about the disputes and the arguments that are disrupting the church. And so Paul's answers to them and his instructions for the church are contained in this letter that we call 1 Corinthians. Paul's hope is that this letter is going to be received better than the last one was and better than Timothy was, that hopefully this will resolve a lot of the issues. So that's the historical backdrop. That's what's going on in Corinth while Paul's trying to address these needs. But I want to look now at the letter itself. As he's trying to resolve these problems, as he's trying to instruct these converts, he has a plan. Now, I'm going to resist the temptation to turn this sermon into a detailed lecture on the structure of Paul's letter. Trust me, it's a, it's a genuine temptation, but I am resisting that. I do just want to note a few important things, however. Okay. First of all, starting in chapter 7 and going on clear to the end of the book, so the, just right before the very end, Paul is answering a series of questions that have been posed to him by this group that's come from Corinth. They are telling him about the goings-on and the problems, but they're also asking, but we have these questions. What about this? What about that? And Paul tackles each of the questions one at a time. He's addressing various issues, explaining what they need to understand and how they need to respond to this and why it matters from 7 to 16. So in chapters 8 to 10, Paul starts discussing this problem of participating in these public ceremonies held in the pagan temples. Worship is on his mind. And he starts by addressing the, this problem of them coming to worship and then going to the pagan temples and participating in these sacrifices to the gods. He says, when, when you do that, you're, you're damaging your witness to the community. You're damaging your ability to preach the gospel. And you're setting up the weaker members of the church to fail, to get into sin and not even know what they're doing. And you're compromising your own worship of the living God by, by mixing it with idolatry. And what he sees is that underneath all of that is this lack. You, you, you're lacking a care for the things of God. You're lacking a care for the lost in the city and a care for your brothers and sisters in the church. That brings him then to chapter 11. In 11 to 14, he's going to shift gears slightly. And now he's going to focus directly on their corporate worship. Because the 8 and 10 have impinged on that 10, 11 to 14. Now he's going to talk about this. And specifically, he's looking at their corporate gatherings as the church. He corrects their misunderstandings, their mistaken attitudes, their mistaken behaviors. He gives them some corrective direction. He clarifies what he had taught them before that they've misunderstood. He expands on it. He wants them to understand what their worship ought to look like, how they ought to order it properly, and why it matters. But even though Paul gives them these careful explanations, he gives them these instructions for how to approach their times of corporate worship, he's actually at least as concerned, I would say he's more concerned about something that's deeper and more important. Because his greater concern than the what they're doing and how they're doing it is why they're doing it and to what aim. See, his greater concern is not how well they do the things they do when they gather together. His greater concern is how well they treat one another when they're together. Not what they do in the service, but how they treat one another when they're there in service. He wants them to understand clearly why they should do what they're doing so that their worship has its intended effect. Worship is not just a thing. It is intended to build up the church, the entire community of believers, and to have an effect on the wider community outside. He says, and, it, and it's not happening the way you're doing it. So you have to correct some things. So as Paul is writing these, these very specific and clear explanations and, and corrections, clarifications in 11 to 14, he pauses in the middle of all of that to point out the underlying foundational truth, the core value, if you will, that has to govern all of our worship and all of our life together in the church. He pauses because he says, 
Listen, you're all confused about what worship ought to be and what it ought to look like because you've misunderstood the point and the purpose of worship. You've Either you've never understood or you've forgotten the main thing that Jesus commanded us. And then he tells them about the way of love. Paul lays out this critical point as clearly as he can in the opening lines, verses 1 to 3. If I have all of these wonderful gifts, if I have all of these wonderful abilities, and I lack love, he says, I, I really don't have anything at all. It doesn't matter what I have or what I do. It doesn't matter how spiritual I look. It doesn't matter how praiseworthy my performance or my appearance or my reputation or my deeds are if I don't have love. Because without love, those good things don't matter. Good things done without love lose their value even when it's in the context of worship. Or let me put it the other way around. What gives value to our worship is not the skillfulness with which I perform. It's not the sophistication of the style of music or the type of music that is played. It's not the enthusiasm that we display in our singing or playing or preaching. It's not the cleverness or the intricacy with which the ideas and the themes are woven together in the service. What gives value to our actions in worship is our love for the people who are gathered with us here. Worshiping God can never be separated from our actions toward people. The Apostle John asks us, how can you love God whom you have not seen if you do not love your brother whom you have seen? If worship is about expressing our love to God, how can I express love to God if I'm not also loving the people right around me? Genuine love for God that's expressed in our worship requires a corollary, a necessary corollary, which is love for one another. Love. Agape is the Greek word. Agape is more than polite toleration. We use the word love a lot. Oh, yeah, I love you. And what do I mean? Well, I don't really want to kill you, so. Well, agape is actually a little more than that. Agape is choosing to act in such a way that I'm acting to bring about the very highest possible good for someone else. The very highest possible good, to bring the greatest benefit to someone else, even at the cost of sacrificing myself. If that's what it'll take, excuse me, if that's what it'll take to bring benefit to someone else. That's agape. That's the love of God. That's Christian love. And we see agape most clearly in the life and death of Jesus Christ, the complete self-sacrificing benevolence for someone else for all of us, in order to bring us good that we didn't deserve and couldn't obtain on our own, to bring us to right standing with God and reconciliation with God. That's agape. We see it in the cross, and that's what we're called to do. Paul's questions, Paul's concerns for the Corinthians ought to be ours today. They ought to be our questions and our concerns. When you and I come to church, do we come with the attitude that says, how can I build up the faith of those around me? How can I help them experience God's presence, experience God's power? How can I use the gifts and the abilities, the resources that God has given me to benefit the whole church, to benefit the others right around me? How can I bring someone else closer to Christ? How can I bring someone else to know Jesus because I'm here? Is that your attitude? Are you concerned about how our corporate worship will honor God? How your personal response to God's mercy will express your love to Him? Are you concerned about what, how what we do is going to help explain the truth of scriptures to people who are seeking to know God? Do you come 
concerned about how our worship and your participation in that worship can reveal Christ to someone, can show the living God to those who don't know him? Are you looking for ways to love the people right around you? That neck that sits in front of you every week and you're very familiar with the outline of that neck. Are you committed to, how can I love that person attached to that neck? Are you looking for ways to share the love of God with people who are hurting, who are lonely, maybe who are shy, people who are wondering if if the happy smiles and the nice greetings and handshakes and hugs, if that goes past 10 o'clock? Or does it just stop with the greet one another time? Are, are you coming here to say, how can I display the love of God? Or is your concern whether or not you were entertained by the music and the preacher? I'll take that as a rim shot. Now, I've added two verses to chapter 13 from the next chapter, from chapter 14 at the close of our scripture reading this morning. I skipped a few paragraphs, and I, I don't want to take something out of context, but I skipped those paragraphs because the content of those passages would send us off in a tangential direction that go way beyond the focus of our, our time together this morning. But those two verses from chapter 14 are important because they give us Paul's reasons for his directions, his reasons for his explanation. They, they reflect the underlying values and principles of the apostolic teaching that forms the basis for Christian faith, for Christian living, for the life of the church. Now, before I explain myself further, I want to pause and make a brief aside on the difference between the early church and us today. Christian churches in the first century, their patterns of worship were different from ours in some significant ways. For instance, they didn't have church buildings to maintain since they met in homes. And all the trustees said, amen. They usually met in whoever's home was big enough for everybody to fit in. And their services were actually much more fluid and, and flexible than ours. They were much more informal. Teaching and exhortation and praying were more dialogical. Questions and comments and discussions was typical, and most everyone was free to take part in the give and take as they, as they shared what God was saying to them through the scriptures or what God was saying to them through the words of the apostles, what the revelation of the Spirit was. In many ways... Going to church in the first century was a lot like going to a home group or what we call a D group, a discipleship group. Now, our Sunday morning worship services, on the other hand, they're more structured. And in part, that's because we have more people in the place. And as numbers increase, structure must also increase. By the way, that's a good reason to get involved in a D group because you can have more opportunities to participate and engage with the Bible and with one another. You have more opportunities to grow. You can grow faster and better by being involved with a small group of people. And if you're not sure where to find them, we have two that will be meeting after the service, one right behind here and the other one up in the conference room. Either one of them are great. Take your pick. Go enjoy. I point all this out because when Paul writes chapter 14, verse 26, about everyone contributing, he's envisioning a meeting of the church where everyone is expected to actively participate in the service. Everyone gets to contribute something based on what God has gifted them to do. He's envisioning their typical meetings where there's fluidity and flexibility. There isn't a starting time. There isn't a stopping time. There isn't an order of service. There certainly isn't a bulletin. Now, as I mentioned last week in passing, the Bible includes a wide variety of activities that fall under the category of expressions of worship. And some of those activities will appeal more to you than to others, and vice versa. There will be some of those activities that are more meaningful to you than some of the other things. If, if you're not particularly musical, 
If you're not musically inclined, you might prefer the more cerebral aspects of, of reading scripture or studying or, or meditating on the truths of God's word. Those are activities of worship. Or you might feel more energized and fulfilled by serving in some capacity behind the scenes, as it were, because that's what really helps you encounter God. Maybe the high point of worship for you is when you get to give your offering or when you get to pray for the church and for our city. There, there's lots of different ways because we're all different. And Paul's point in verse 26 is very simple. There are a lot of things that can be done in worship, a lot of different ways to express your response of worship, and you can all participate and contribute what you have to offer to God and to one another. Love allows liberty. And liberty in worship is one of the principal essential building blocks of Christian worship. When I say liberty, I'm not saying anything goes. That's not what I'm advocating. Because Paul isn't saying to the Corinthians, hey, whatever it feels good, do it, that's fine. He is saying that we have to always guard the freedom of people to express in appropriate ways their worship to God. If I love God and I love people, I want to find ways to help them express their love for God, even if that's in a way that doesn't quite fit me. God didn't make us all alike. That's a very good thing, by the way. If, if you think about it, if everyone was exactly like you, you would be completely lonely. It would be like always being alone because everyone would be exactly like you. Okay. So there's always going to be people who like what you don't like, who are energized and enthused by things that leave you scratching your head and going, really? Okay. And we have to remember that God is looking at their heart and not so much their outward expression. And I, I would venture to say that if you will decide to love someone, you'll start to see their heart as well, and that'll help you make more sense of what they're doing, and it might also help you see how and why you might want to join in with them. I was thinking about a story, but I think I'm going to skip it. That's right. The point is that liberty and worship is important and necessary so that our expressions of worship are authentic not coerced, not mimicked, not feigned. Forced uniformity has never been God's desire for the church. That's the way of a tyrant. That's not the way of a loving father. Love allows liberty. Freedom in personal expression, certainly, but also freedom in liturgy allowing for variation and adaptation to meet the changing needs of a group or to meet the changing society needs. Changes in society sometimes require a change in liturgy. A change in God's assignment might bring change in the liturgy. A change in our growth of our understanding of God can help us to make changes in liturgy. I, <clears throat> something that's appropriate for a 7-year-old may not be appropriate for a 77-year-old though you might want to try it sometime because it can help you. My point is that liberty in worship includes allowing the freedom to use differing styles or different elements or different structures because freedom is about meeting the needs of the congregation and the people in the place and the situation. Freedom also means the freedom to resist trends and fads if they're not helpful if they don't fit with what God has directed a church to be or to do. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's true. And just because it's old doesn't make it gold. My mom taught me the difference between being historical and being old. She was a history teacher. She was good at it. Some buildings are historic and they need to be preserved. And some buildings are just old and they need to be torn down. The same is true when it comes to traditions. Hello? It's true. Paul says, let everything be done to build up the church. Love allows liberty, but love also recognizes limits. 
I'm not going to try to say that again or fast. That's I'm doing it. In these two verses in chapter 14, Paul gives us two important limits that we must remember, we must apply when we start exercising our liberty. We say, well, I'm free in Christ. Yes, you are. There's a wide variety of ways that the Bible recognizes as appropriate ways to express love for God in worship. None of them are out of bounds. None of them are to be forbidden. None of them are to be discouraged. But the question isn't, well, are these permitted? The question is, is this helpful? Is this considerate? Is this edifying to others around me? Is what I'm doing encouraging others in their worship, or is it drawing attention to me and hindering them from entering into worship with the rest of the congregation? Now, last week we read about David dancing before the Lord in worship. I believe it's perfectly appropriate, or it can be, for someone to dance before the Lord in worship. But if you're dancing around and knocking people over with your exuberance and smacking them in the face while you throw your arms around, you're not being considerate. Okay? You're not being loving, and that worship isn't an expression of the love of God. You're just being crazy. Okay? Your freedom needs to be limited by love for those around you. Worship isn't an expression of love for God if you're abusing the people around you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is considerate. Love isn't envious. Love isn't sitting in the pew thinking, how many of my songs did we get to sing this week? Love isn't arrogant. Well, I'm right. My way is right. And love doesn't keep score of wrongs suffered. If you're doing that, you've lost sight of the whole point of the gospel. And you've forgotten how much God's forgiven isn't keeping score of your wrongs. Love isn't focused on me at all. It's focused on what I can do for someone else. How can I make your worship better ought to be our approach. How can I help you experience the presence of God? How can I help you understand the truth of God? How can I help you feel the love of God and know his power? So the very first limit of love is this. I limit my freedom in order to serve those around me. I limit my freedom of expression if exercising that freedom is inconsiderate or unloving or unhelpful. Because my worship ought to help build up the whole church. And the second limit is like unto it. And that is this. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, Paul says. God's ways are not chaotic. They're not disorderly. Paul says, let everything be done if it's helpful for the church, but take care that what's done reflects God's nature and ways. Order doesn't have to mean stuffy. It doesn't have to mean stifling. It doesn't have to mean boring. Okay? Having order doesn't mean everyone is sitting still and not moving. Your mom may have taught you that, but that really isn't what it means. <laughs> she was just trying to keep you from going, flying through all the, the pews, messing with everybody's head. Okay? Order doesn't require following a predetermined and invariable sequence. You can have a lot of movement and activity and energy. You can have variation and innovation and spontaneity and still have order. Because order has more to do with the rightness of something not the restrictedness of something. It's not the sequence, it's the rightness that matters. And worship that is orderly is worship that is centered on God, fashioned out of a love for God, based on the principles and the teaching of Scripture, with consideration for the needs of the people, the setting, the situation. And that could be something quite bare and somber. I think of our Good Friday service earlier this year. Or it could be something quite jubilant and explosive, like Easter that followed that Good Friday earlier this year. It could even be something that's improvisational in part or even in the whole. Because orderly doesn't mean it must be just so and nothing else. It means being appropriate to the time and the place and the people and the situation and the need. So how do I know what's appropriate? Well, we're back to the first limit. 
what's helpful, what's edifying, what will build up the church. Complaints about changes in worship have been around for, oh, I don't know, 1,400 years at least. Because church leaders balked in the 6th century about the introduction of a new kind of chanting. And in the early Renaissance years, the attempt to introduce harmony in the vocal music was sternly rebuffed on the grounds that singing in unison is the only proper way to show the unity of the church and its faith. And then there's that whole argument about using instruments, right, Greg? And which instruments can be used, and how can they be played, and so on and so on. After all is said and done, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, this one thing must be true of us and must be true of our worship. We must be absolutely committed to this, that we will love one another more than we love a particular style of music or a particular style or type of service. Anything less is unworthy of the God we claim to worship and unworthy of the people of God who are called by his name. That must be the hallmark of our worship. That must be our calling card. That must be what we're known for at First Christian. Not a particular style, but a people who are determined to love one another and to love those who come in and to love the lost and to love God with all that we have. Everything else can change, but love must change.